got a great group of panelists. My name's Kurt Summers from Low Banks of America. I'll be moderating today's panel. Uh, as, you, as I mentioned earlier, we've done a panel in, couple of panels in the past. The last one was on customer service. Had some great discussion on that. Uh, and I want to encourage you guys as this conversation continues today, uh, and as I've said in the last panel, make sure the conversation continues on LinkedIn. Reach out to the panelists, uh, your peers, thinking about this topic. This is a big topic. We can't cover this topic today in its entirety. We're going to barely scratch the surface. But we are going to give you, chance, you guys a chance to ask some questions uh, to participate in our, in our discussion. So let me start by asking, how many dealers and distributor companies do we have in the audience today? Let me just see a show of hands. All right, hold them up. Leave them up. Now, how many of you, leave your hand up, if you have an rent, active rental fleet? All right. So it's, it's obviously a part of your business, right? You think about it in the context of providing service to your customers, and I kind of want to dovetail on that when we get started in our discussion. But first, let me inter 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 uh, introduce the panelists. Uh, again, a great group that we've got today. Um, our first uh, panelist here to my immediate right, our immediate past DD committee chair, Bob Piskey, Generator Tech, Arizona Generator Technology. So let me tell you a little bit about Bob's background. Bob began his career in 1979 working at a cat dealer as a field service helper. Twelve years later, Bob had been involved in many complex systems, startups, repairs, and emergencies. In 1990, Arizona Generator Technology began. Twenty-five years later, Bob is responsible responsibilities maintaining customer support in three store locations. Bob is currently the president, technician, trainer, and he will sweep the floor when it's necessary. So welcome to Bob. Our next panelist, Chris Dolnick, project manager at Sunbelt Rentals. Thank you, Chris, for being here. Chris actually is filling in for Mike. Is Mike in the audience? Where's Mike? Yeah, okay. So, so Mike was originally going to be on our panel, and he tagged Chris, and you'll understand why here in a minute. His technical expertise is uh, pretty outstanding. So let me tell you a little bit about Chris. His duties include technical support of power generation, distribution products, special products, and power generation training. His experience, five years in a manufacturing environment, electrical troubleshooter of production equipment, relay logic automation. 24 years with Onan, then Cummins Onan, power generation. A little over three years as a service tech, balance in technician, excuse me, balance in technical sales of prime and standby power systems. And now 15 years with Sunbelt Rentals, five years as a profit center manager, 10 years as project manager. So let's welcome Chris to the panel. Our next panelist, Tricia Swice from, from uh, Sunbelt Transformer. Not to be mistaken with Sunbelt Rental. These are two different companies. They bring two different perspectives. Uh, Tricia is vice president of marketing with Sunbelt Transformer. She works with Chad, so that's Chad's company. Uh, Tricia joined Sunbelt in 2009 and oversees all marketing and business development for Sunbelt's national and international markets. Tricia also plays a, role, a vital role in Sunbelt's rental division, leading business development efforts in various custom segments. She has been an EXA member since 2011 and hopes to continue to grow. <coughs> excuse me, hopes to continue to grow with the organization. Let's wel welcome Tricia to the uh, panel. And our fourth and final panelist, Mr. Joe Fiorito. He's with Caterpillar. National Accounts is his role and responsibility, which means he does a lot. He's responsible for a lot. He's all over the country. Joe joined Caterpillar in 2000 to the Cat Rental Power Group. He's responsible for providing technical and marketing support for rental projects and dealer development for Caterpillar, Electric Power North America. Prior to joining Caterpillar, Joe spent 10 years in the electrical utility sector with experience in coal-fired and nuclear power plants, as well as the wire side of transmission and distribution. He worked for the Commonwealth, he worked for Commonwealth Edison in fossil generation support, nuclear support, and corporate and T&D purchasing. He has a BS degree in mechanical engineering from the Illinois Institute of Technology and received his certified engineer, energy manager and certified energy procurement certificates from the Association of Energy Engineers. 
For the past 15 years, he has been an OEM providing support and strategy globally in the power rental business for CAT. Let's welcome Joe. Thanks for being with us, Joe. Being a technician, it's all about problem solving. And when we started out in 1990, uh, rental was one of the last things that was on the horizon, but it was certainly something that was uh, high on the priority list as we grow. And uh, having a rental fleet is, without question, a differentiator. That's probably the best way to look at it. It's a differentiator from uh, your companies and everybody else out there. It's a, uh, a great revenue stream once you own your own equipment. And uh, really, if you break it down, the perception is, is that it's a pile of employees that don't require an HR department. Wow. So uh, it, they work endlessly. All you got to do is put fuel in them, and the customer pays for that on top of it. So from a standpoint of rental, it is without question a huge opportunity to be able to reach out to customers that you may have never done business with, uh, solve their problem, be able to respond in such a way to where n that customer has never experienced such a level of professionalism to solve a high level of pain point. Because think about that for a second. If you're in a middle of a production or data center or a business that is totally dependent on uh, on a process or a revenue stream and all of a sudden there's no electricity no power hospital think about those things it is without question a huge issue of stress and when you can take that stress off your customer and be able to deliver in spades and have them up and running in power and just take that all off their plate, you are a friend for life. And so uh, we've done that. That's what rental does. It does that over and over and over again. Uh, I can go on with example after example. We built an 800 KW that went up to a hospital within a few months of completing its uh, build. And it was at the hospital for three years. Now, had we re-rented somebody else's equipment, it'd have our competitor's name on that job site, but it was our piece of equipment. And then when it became too small, they needed a big one, we bought another one, a 1250. And then finally, after four and a half years, they finally bought generators from us and put in a solution and replaced their, their plant. So it's those kinds of activities that, uh, really separate you from your competition. And at the same time, you make money. It's awesome. So I guess I got a little picture here of uh, Bob's Yeah, and you don't have to fleet. start big. You can yeah, start yeah. small. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that resembles everybody's rental fleet, right? The little red wagons kill me. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, that was a real job. We, we were tasked with a parade, and they wanted power, and so we put together, that was our first rental fleet. So you know, that doesn't take a lot of money. <laughs> and, of course, 25 years later, I don't know if you put the... I didn't get okay. it in time, yeah. 25 years later, we're 180-some-odd units, and several two megs. So uh, you got to start somewhere. You can start as small as that. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. That's good. So let's talk about rental responsibility, safety, and success. Uh, Chris, with so much at stake supporting our customers, uh, as Bob described, these emergency response situations, it's obvious that we need to do rental really well to achieve success for our customers and ourselves. Share with the group one or two challenges you've experienced in ways that you brought your customers safe solutions for the rental needs? Well, often uh, the site that's picked for the generator will not support the weight. So spotting the, the unit is critical. Often the facility doesn't have a means by which to attach the generator to the building. So you need to bring a contractor in and separate from the utility and safely connect. Cables, voltage rating, current rating, uh, locating, sp spotting the cable. Uh, supporting the cable, providing some kind of barriers to keep people, people away from it. You know, 
right now things are kind of crazy. Uh, during uh, Sandy in New York, we actually had units running where people stole the cables. Now, these were large 800 cable generators. Mm -hmm. And the units were still running when we got there. So, you know, safety is critical in securing the, the site. And also, when you spot it, you have to make sure you provide a means by which to service it, fuel it. Uh, a lot of times a customer will have a location where it's tough to get to. So, uh, same thing, uh, training. Uh, it's a big thing. You gotta have uh, talented people that understand what they're doing. Uh, you use multiple feed per phase. You wanna make sure that the length of the cables is the same. You don't wanna have overheating and burning up the cables. So there's a lot of misinformation in our industry. So trying to get the guys educated and trained, it's difficult, you know, sales and the rental especially, is very competitive. To try to get the guy out of the workforce and into a classroom is difficult. So that's our biggest challenge right now, is to get the, the profit center managers to give us the talented guys that we need to further train them so that we keep them safe. So between keeping the facility safe, where the generator is, keeping the customer happy, and have the equipment perform, safety is a big issue all the way around. That's it. So do you have a training program, Chris, yes. in-house? Yes, we have an in-house. We'll have uh, distributors or, uh, so that we buy the equipment from. They'll provide a training. And then I myself go in and kind of get to the nuts and bolts. Uh, Richard, uh, you know, I'm familiar with the gentleman. I had some time uh, in, uh, few, way back when. We had some issues. And customers often will not put enough conductors and uh, mm -hmm. will burn up your generators. They'll burn up the, the, the breakers. So the key thing is to make sure that you have the guy that brings the equipment on site. If the customer says, I'll hook it up, somebody's got to oversee it. It's your equipment. At the end of the day, if he smokes it, yeah, it's your loss. So it's interesting you think about kind of what these two panels have painted a picture of. Great opportunity, great customer service opportunity. Uh, can be a really successful part of your business. But if you don't do it well, you can get yourself in trouble. And so doing your homework in advance, and that's again what this group's all about. You ought to ask your peers. You know, you're getting ready to buy your first fleet of rental generators or you're ready to expand your fleet. There's a lot of information in EXA, a lot of information in this, in this membership uh, that's available to you. So uh, please keep that in mind. We've got a little picture here, Chris. You want to kind of just share us yeah. with that? In uh, Montgomery, Alabama. Get your mic see. there, Chris, please. Thank you. In Montgomery, Alabama, everybody's familiar with what an arc blast is, right? At 480 volts and when you get some serious amps, if there's an encroachment of liquid like water or whatever, Within less than half a cycle, you can get a blast. Temperature goes up over 12,000 degrees. The material vaporizes. It expands 64,000 to one ratio. So you got pressure, you got flame, you get heat. Panels blow off the panels, and uh, there's material embedded in a brick or, or a block. And that happened on the 16th floor of the building. That RSA building provides uh, like welfare services. It's got the state computer system and. So it's a critical uh, load. Uh, when, when they suffered the damage, we brought six uh, 1500s, and the contractor just kind of brought a whole bunch of panels and ran different panels, different generators, and we thought it was going to be a short, short duration. When they found out they had to cast the uh, copper bus bars, and it was going to be a number of months, so they called me in, and I brought another gentleman in, and we picked the critical side of the building, and we split the building in half. So the three generators on the left-hand side in this picture, they were supporting the critical load. So I don't know if you, can, if you look close, you'll see that the first two from left to right, the louvers are open, the, the one in the middle, the louvers are closed. It was connected and parallel ready. It was a redundant system. One machine could handle everything. So we would run both, split the load. If one would go down, the second would come in. The third one was a backup to the first two. On the other side, it was less critical load, so we just had two 1500s. And again, like we said about the safety, the electrical contractor on site, when I said I want to tie the neutrals on both sides of the building, I want the mechanical grounds, he came up with this story that uh, there's gonna be cross currents. I didn't understand, so I drew a little picture real quick and said here's a transfer switch. You got utility, you got emergency power, you got load. What do you do with the neutrals? What do you do with the grounds? Oh, I misread it. So there's a lot of misinformation in our industry, electrical industry, is relatively young, it's only 110 years old or something like that, and a lot of misinformation. So 
we had that project running, um, I would say over five months, almost six months. And we've not lost power. Both sides of the building operated during the whole time without loss of power. That's a great, great picture of what rental opportunities exist out there. Large project like that. I want to go back to the training element again, just to keep you guys on track. Uh, a lot of these folks on the panel actually offer training to their customers as well, and many of you may offer that training uh, also. So let's talk about the business opportunities for just a minute. And by the way, you'll notice that on each screen there is a uh, ability to text me your questions. Feel free to do that, and I'll read them or save them for the, the discussion, and you can raise your hand and ask those questions. So for business opportunities, I think right now we can all say that we enjoy being part of a growing, thriving industry. Power generation is a great place to be. What unique opportunities do you see, Tricia, uh, for our DD members, specifically to uh, the rental business? Sure. Um, so I want to really showcase the fact that how us in here can utilize other companies in, in this room to complete a power package to the customer. Um, pretty much acting as a one-stop shop for, for the end customer. A lot of times you guys might be getting a phone call just specifically asking for a rental generator, but a lot of times after that they're sourcing other vendors looking for additional equipment, whether it's cable, switch gear, or transformer. So we, what we do internally is to tell our people to ask the question, what are you doing with this equipment? Because a lot of times you will see the scope of the project being able to utilize other companies in here to really create this package deal so you could promote this one-stop shop type of um, product to your customer. We see the ideal rental customer focusing on three attributes, speed, ease, and support. So speed being obviously, you know, 24-7, quote turnaround, and the speed of equipment. The ease, the ease is obviously going to be the ease of work in the equipment to the fact that I could call one customer and they're going to provide everything for me. That's the advantage. And then the support, that's the technical support where you know we, you have the ability to go ahead and quote a project that might be a little complex and then obviously you know the ability to see the job through. Um, two of the main rental um, obje objectives that we see is obviously the plan. So this is anywhere from load bank testing to contingency plans, peak shaving, um, maintenance, and we I actually, can you pull the next slide? Yep. This is a good example of kind of how we can all tie in together is this job right here is a, it's, <coughs> excuse me, it's a high profile job in Alberta and the customer got the call and, and what was happening, it was a gas plant and they couldn't move their gas down a pipeline. No, the, the opposite one. The, go back. Go back one. Sorry. No, that's okay. But basically, it was taking the flared gas and they wanted to generate a power with it. Um, it was five megawatt of power backfeeding under the grid. And the good thing, I don't want to talk too much on the technical aspect on this job, but the thing I want to recognize here is the fact that the company that actually got awarded this project only has two products in there. So they were able to recognize the fact that there are other vendors that are out there to help get to the point where this job was awarded to me. And the good thing with this is that the customer said the, you know, the three reasons basically that they were awarded it was the speed, the ease, and the support. You know, they were able to locate the, the inventory so they knew their resources. Um, it was easy. They packaged it, a nice package quote to a package product, and then the support to go ahead and, and actually fill the need there. Um, the second being an emergency, 911, obviously, with natural disasters. Um, and accidents, anything affecting the power grid. But what's important there is knowing the resources. You know, obviously in, in my industry, you know, one, with my comp company, if there's a transformer, transformer failure, you know, knowing where to go to maybe get a replacement in there and um, being proactive with your guys' as customers, showcasing, you know, having your, cus your rental fleet available, letting your technicians know that something's coming, but also letting your customers know that you have the ability to offer that complete package solution. Um, the other things I just wanted to touch about is, um, you know, knowing your resources within amongst us. Um, you know, the technical expertise is up there, whether it's low or medium voltage. There's companies within EXA that can help assist in creating these, and we have, and there's that expertise here. Um, just like Chris, training programs, we offer um, training internally and externally to our customers 
showcasing you know, what to ask your customer, what we need to know, um, probably the same with Chris. And then on a marketing front, what's this mean um, for your company? Obviously, you know, customer retention, um, new customer segments, um, customer satisfaction, promotion, and, and ultimately brand loyalty. So the rental business is a fun business. It's, it's very high speed. Um, it's something that I got into about six years ago and, and seems to, I, it's one of my favorite aspects of my job. So, um, yeah, oh, I totally missed another slide, sorry. <laughs> This, this job right here um, was an interesting job. It was, it was a drag line. Um, for those of you that might not know what that is, it was, um, it's just a big ex ex esca excavating, excavator. And what it does is it just creeps across. And it was a Mr. Tom in Alabama. And we worked with a company. And we were able to package a complete solution and make it super easy. And then the next picture is just um, show, showing um, the tie-in. Um, basically, just knowing that the resources are out there, and, and to be able to provide that, you know, that turnkey solution for your customer goes a long way. Good, thanks, Tricia. So, you know, I think the point that she's making is there's a lot of resources in the industry, in the marketplace, a lot of EXO members that can help us as DDS uh, be more successful, be successful in this. It doesn't have to just be the, uh, the little portables on the uh, little red wagons, although we can have some of those. I think it's also uh, important to think about those more complex projects. Not only do you have resources available for equipment, medium voltage applications and whatnot, but you've got technical resources as well. So keep that in mind. Um, like Trisha said, one of the things on that five unit set, we had to have isolation breakers in addition to the main breakers for paralleling. And the purpose of it was since we were feeding main panels, so on the one side, we had a 9,000 amp bus that we're feeding with the three generators. Well, if one generator needed a replacement, just turning off that generator, the, bus, the, the wires were still hot, back fed. Mm -hmm. So we ran at some uh, circuit breakers from uh, Sunbelt and also the main bus panels. So we had a number of breakers. We had a, a, a 4,000 amp bus on the other side. So again, resources and working together, mm -hmm. we could respond fast enough and get them a working system. Okay, so if I want to rent breakers, I go to Tricia. If I want to rent generators, I go to Chris. Okay, get that right. Now, you got that? Sunbelt rental, Sunbelt transformer. All right. <laughs> All right, so let's talk a little bit about rental is awesome. All right, Joe's going to share us a little bit about his perspective. Joe's been doing this, as you heard from his bio. He's been doing this for a long time. He, uh, he described to us at breakfast this morning the personality of folks that are involved in this business. And I'll let him share a little bit about that if he so chooses. But it's a unique industry that requires a certain skill set to be involved in this. For Tricia to be involved in it for six years, as she has, speaks uh, volumes to her character and her commitment to her customers. So Joe, rental is awesome. Help our members catch this vision and passion. What makes it awesome? Well, Kurt, it is awesome. And if you click the next <laughs> slide here, it really comes down to the three P's, that being your people, your products, and you absolutely must have the passion for the business. This is not your normal, everyday, cookie cutter type of business. So, <clears throat> one more slide. That picture there is uh, a group photo from our annual team building event from our annual sales meeting. And I like to say collectively, that's my closest 400 friends. <laughs> and those 400 people up there are, that's the sales staff and marketing staff and management for the uh, Cat Rental Power Group for North America. But what they have as well behind them is an additional 1,500 technicians to back them up on a day-to-day -day basis. These are the biggest go-getter, type A personality people, extreme competitors you've ever met in your lives. And I love them dearly like the best friends I've ever had. And being in this industry for 15 years, I've, actually, I've been around the world. I've been to every horrible disaster it, there is. Um, been to 35 different countries, always chasing rental projects. And I can honestly say that if I were to be parachuted from the moon and just land somewhere on the earth, there's a pretty good chance I'm going to run into somebody that I've met over the years that knows about rental, knows about our industry. And coming here to this meeting, 
I knew Vaughn was here, and that was really the only person I knew besides Trish that was going to be here. And I was shocked when I started walking in here, running into at least a dozen people that I've met over the years. And uh, so the people part is here. You guys have a great, great organization. Very impressed with it overall. And not only do we have a great group internally, you people like Trish and Direct Wire out there, the suppliers, we call them our partners. Without them, we don't make these connections. We don't make this stuff happen. I mean, we're an OEM that makes generator sets, but our dealers need everything to go with it in order to support the customer's needs. So the people is huge. Absolutely got to get that network surrounding you. Next slide. <clears throat> On the product side, I am through and through a gearhead. I'm a mechanical engineer. I've been drag racing since 15 years old. I know what it's like to make 2,000 horsepower. I know what it's like to go 180 miles an hour and a quarter mile. I like big toys, and I can really appreciate good quality. And having a job like this, we get to play with toys like this on a day-in, day-out basis, making customers happy, saving their day for them. I mean, it's just something that's really just been uh, a great fit. And for anyone who's got that same type of personality, it's, it's a win-win for all of us. And as, as Bob mentioned, if you're getting into this business, I do recommend starting small. Maybe not the wagon size small, but <laughs> <laughs> truly, get, you know, you want to kick the tires, you want to get into business, start up with little 20 KWs, 20, 30s, 45s, get yourself in that range there where you're, you mix around with some single phase, some three phase, nothing too complex. Chances are you're not using a transformer yet, so good for these little fair jobs, small EC contractors, you know, towing shows. It'd be a good place to cut your teeth on that type of stuff. And whatever you do, pay attention to what you're buying because there are some cheap and cheerfuls out there, some stuff that may or may not get you what you need to do. So you get what you pay for. Even if you go into the used market, just make sure you get a quality piece. And by far, make sure you get the accessories to go with this. You talk to any rental manager out there who rents a generator and cables, they would quit the generator business tomorrow to just rent the cables. <laughs> the ROI on cables is weeks, not years. Mm -hmm. So you got to have the goods to go with the, with the solution. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> Last one there for the term is you got to love your job for this one. And we have a term in rental we say you get it. And it's pretty easy to figure out who in our industry gets it. And for those that don't, they tend to go on to elsewhere, different jobs. And when you think about it, when the disasters happen, what is everybody doing? Backing up their stuff and fleeing. Mm -hmm. What are we doing? We're loading up our trucks and our cars and we're driving down to this. Uh, I can remember when uh, Hurricane Katrina happened, I had a friend down in Louisiana who sent me a all access pass from the governor to get into Jefferson Parish. And uh, we were, we loaded up our truck in Chicago full of gear, donations and headed down there. I got about, Eight hours out, I was halfway through Indiana, and um, Indiana's finest pulled me over and says, what's your hurry? And I says, I'm going down to help at Hurricane Katrina, and here's my paperwork to show I'm doing it. He says, 99 miles an hour, don't you think that's a little fast? <laughs> I go, yeah, but there's people dying out there, okay? We're trying to turn the lights back on. He's okay. He says, I check my paperwork. He says, have a good day. One hour later, I get pulled over again. Hmm. Still, in the, still in Indiana. I'm like, oh, crap. So get the paperwork again, and I give the same story to him. He's like, OK. I, says, uh, I said, by the way, where were you hiding? He says, oh, I was down in these weeds. And I said, oh, that's pretty good action back there. I said, I like that. I said, how fast was I going? He's like, 88. I said, OK, well, at least I was slowing down for the journey. But uh, you got to be that ment mentality. You want to get in there and save the day and work days and nights. I mean, these are the people that we don't turn our we don't turn our phones off ever. It's by our bed stands. It's it's you're never off the clock days, nights, and weekends. And when you find these people, you got to pay them because you have to realize they're not working a 40-hour shift. These people are mentally in it all the time, and um, they're almost like firemen wannabes. So when you think about it, this is what their action is all about on a day-in, day-out basis. And um, if you get these three Ps right, as Bob has mentioned, the last P you get there is profits. I've done a lot of operation audits at cat dealerships, and I can tell you right now that the profit after direct expenses for a successful rental power organization 
is amazing. It's probably one of the most lucrative organizations we have within the CAT network. So if you got your, you got your stuff working, you make a lot of cash. Good, thank you, Joe. I want to know who the guy is with the green helmet and the red scarf. That's actually me. <laughs> I'm dressed as Speed Racer because I was introducing our team building event <laughs> in Scottsdale. <laughs> So Joe's actually going to speak tomorrow in the general session. He's our uh, closing speaker on, guess what, rental. So he's going to share some more. And he's going he's to touch on uh, one of the things he mentioned in this little discussion here was the equipment and making sure you know what you get to get the quality. Bob mentioned this in our conversations as well. Uh, and I've got several questions on my phone, so we're going to go to a couple of questions and we'll open up to the audience. But. Um, Touch on kind of what you guys have just mentioned uh, related to quality. When you buy a fleet of generators, do you guys run them through a battery of tests? Do you just you know, check the specs? Uh, Bob, talk a little bit about what you do with your uh, new rental fleet. Well, the worst thing you can do at any time in your company is to assume anything. And we made a purchase of six 320 kW mobile units, and I won't mention the manufacturer. And you assume that the company, being a big global company, has their uh, stuff together. A different word starts with an S. And uh, being in Arizona, you got to deal with the heat. And we load bank these units. We took possession of them in May. Load bank, and we load bank everything before we put it out on rent because you need to certify it. The last thing I want to do is go to bed at night wondering is something not quite right with something because these units are running in a very critical application most of the time. And uh, so we load bank uh, these units out in our yard and they wouldn't hold uh, temperature at a 90 degree ambient. And it clearly states 105 degree ambient cooling systems. So it was about a year later before, and we did not pay them 20% hold out waiting to certify them. They would not fix them. And they walked from their own product. And it was one of the worst experiences I ever had dealing with a global company that walked from their own product. So don't assume anything. And you want to test everything that you purchase you want to certify everything you purchase, and you want to be able to sleep good at night knowing that your cable is in great shape, you got the right people in place. Can't agree with that more. It's a different breed, those guys. The work ethic is just off the charts. And, uh, and, and just ensure that your processes and procedures of checking in that equipment recertifying the equipment, putting it on the ready line, and being able to get it back out on a job site. It's gotta be top notch. And uh, the last thing you want is to have a piece of equipment out running and have it fail, because that's a black eye. Mm -hmm. Anybody so. else on the panel wanna speak to that? And we'll get into maintenance in just a minute. We actually have a question from the audience that talks about, uh, um, do you need to set up a more extensive preventive maintenance program for rental equipment to ensure longevity? Kind of speaks to what you were just talking. But talk about when you buy new equipment. That's kind of the point right. I want to make right At now. At one time, the manufacturers were proud of what they made. And like the cooling system that, you, that Bob addressed, 120 to 125 degrees ambient was typical. All of a sudden, some worldly suppliers dropped it to 85. Temperature of the generator is a critical measuring stick of how big a generator is. But you don't have the ability to pick. Sometimes the manufacturer doesn't give you the opportunity to learn about it and lets you pick your poison. And the price that you pay for a hotter generator is not much different than the one that you'd be paying for a cooler running generator. So the temperature rise of the generator in reality has nothing to do with the quality of the insulation material. What it is, is how hard is that copper in that machine being stressed? So if you get a 125 uh, degree rise versus a 85, your two frame sizes smaller because you go to 105 and then 125. So you have a generator end that's two frame sizes smaller. 
that will not last as long as the 85. So you invested the capital in it, and you wanted to let it go, so maybe 10 years. It's not gonna last you more than maybe two or three years. So return on investment. So when you're buying your equipment, find, you gotta have one and a half horsepower per kilowatt. It's, it's actually 1.56 uh, horse per thousand on the three phase, and it's two mechanical horse for each thousand on a single phase. So if you don't have the horsepower, and it's actual free after all the parasitics are taken off, you have to have 1.56 horsepower for each thousand watts on a three-phase generator. And a single phase, you need two mechanical horsepower because of the magnetic angle. So the horsepower being delivered to the, to the, to the generator comes up differently. So more torque is required. So you gotta make sure that you do your homework, get the right generator for your application so it'll survive in the environment. So you guys have Joe, Tricia, you guys have a large, large fleet of equipment. How do you keep up with it from a maintenance standpoint? Let's, let's address what this audience member asked us. Uh, do you set up more intensive preventive maintenance programs for rental equipment to ensure longevity? Talk a little bit about your PM programs. I mean, I could just speak briefly on, from our standpoint, um, we do, you know, ten, rental for our company is about 10% of our overall business and the sales aspect. And we have set up special um, testing procedures that Chad actually orchestrated to make sure, um, you know, once a rental goes out and once it comes back, to make sure, you know, the equipment is comes back as is. Um, testing the cable, testing the transformer. Um, basically, we, we do have certain applic or certain testing procedures in play that are specific to our rental fleet. Um, what about you? Well, as an OEM, we actually publish our uh, recommended service guidelines, and if you guys know anything about Caterpillar, we're extremely conservative um, to a fault. I mean, we, all rental products today come standard with 500 hour oil change intervals, but if you do your scan, I'm sorry, your scheduled oil samples, you'll realize that you're probably can push it a little bit further. Some customers are smart enough to do that, others not so much. The big concern right now going forward is, you know, you've gotta keep it clean, gotta keep it load banked, and going into tier four is gonna be the biggest challenge of all of our lives with mm -hmm. these products. Y you can't be oversizing to an excess. You gotta be careful with temperatures. You got additional fluids to maintain in the unit as well. So your maintenance staff needs additional training, um, parts on hand. You're talking uh, oxidation catalyst now that need to be cleaned on a you know, regular basis on occasion. And the EPA, thankfully or unthankfully, has mandated a lot of rules that have mandated what we can and cannot do as an OEM. Uh, on the machine side of the business, they've got these little buttons when the alarm goes off, they can go ahead and de defeat it and defeat mm -hmm. it and defeat it and defeat it. And then, oops, that's a $5,000 catalyst you just bought. Mm -hmm. On the generator side, we don't have that luxury. Um, we don't have a defeat button. They won't let us have a defeat button. But uh, you got to stay up to date with this stuff. There's no doubt about it. So how many in the audience actually have tier four rental products in their fleet? Anybody? Yeah, so you guys know or you're learning what that experience is like, what you've got to do, right? It's a learning experience. And getting that turned around into an ROI when you're competing with uh, previous built products, right? How, how do you do that? That's a little bit of a challenge. I've got a couple more questions on the uh, on the phone here, but I wanna make sure we've got a mic. So Lyndon's got a mic. I wanna, anybody that didn't text me a question but has a question, raise your hand and Lyndon's gonna walk around and give you a chance to uh, ask the panel anything you wanna ask. Otherwise, I'll continue on with the phone. Anybody? Okay, we got one up here, Lyndon, on the front row. One thing we've seen, uh, we're in the generator sales and service business, and people in the generator looking for generators to purchase or looking for generators to have them worked on find us. How do you approach the market as far as people looking for rentals? For us, people looking for rentals aren't aware of us as opposed to the rental companies. So we're more tied into the sales and service side. How can, what's the best approach to find the people who are specifically looking to rent generators. Okay, let me make sure I understand your question. So uh, outside of the traditional generator service and sales uh, customer base, 
Are there other opportunities that are purely rental customers, and like how, entertainment, like shut down power plants, people that don't look for a backup rental while you're repairing their standby unit, more pure rental markets. Is that what you're asking? Yes, sir. In the, in the rental market, we're not somebody that's immediately sought out or thought of. Right. Um, it's more so, say, the Sun Belts or something. Those are the rental companies that people automatically think of and go to. Uh, how can we market ourselves to those people so that we're approached for rental markets as well? Okay. Anybody on the panel want to take a stab at that? Performance. Grab your mic there. Quality of equipment and how much do you have in a, in a fleet? If somebody's going to rent equipment from you and something goes wrong, they don't have time to try to fix it many times. So if there's no depth of product, so you have to have enough equipment to back it up. And also have the people, uh, like Joe said, that are really passionate and committed to it. Because the, the money that you're going to make in this business, general rental, is typically after 5. Very few of the big jobs come in at 8 o'clock in the morning. Most of them happen after hours. So you have to have a team that will respond, and then you build your reputation. So you, you got to respond to the customer's need, provide the product, and then provide the support. And, you know, we're talking about life and safety and all this. Let me tell you, a sewage treatment plant goes down, when that flush that handle, that stuff doesn't go in one direction, that's a major problem. Mm -hmm. So, so it, it, the, the, the emergency is dependent on, you know, what the situation calls for. But the, the number of pieces of equipment that you have and then the support, I think, will get you into that. And, and do you have outside sales? Yes. You have outside sales? Do you guys target electrical contractors at all? That's your number one source. Let's give them the mic, make sure everybody can hear that. Uh, I could say something on this too, because I was we were in the same boat. Um, we were primarily sales and service. And um, when we started getting into the rental business, it was the same type of thing as, you know, how to, how to get it out there that we're now not just a sales company, but we are a rental company. And I think for us, it's, you know, like Joe said, targeting the, the electrical contractors, that's huge. Um, you can do that in various ways. There's tons of electrical contractor shows that are smaller shows, organizations um, that really can do help you by the word of mouth and and even every time you're you have a customer calling you know letting them know hey do you guys know that we do rentals we i still do that i have a customer call in and say they want to buy a transformer i'm like you know and it's for and i know it's for something that they need quickly and that ultimately they just think that they their transformer needs repaired i'm like that's fine but do you, you do know that we rent transformers as well so i think that's the word of mouth um also just organically you know putting stuff on your website um so, you know a lot of times Electrical contractors, if they're not 100% certain of a company to call otherwise, you know, they're just going to Google in a, in a quick, quick thing, you know, where can I rent this equipment from? And, and just doing small marketing things really um, will help grow that. And it's really a lot about word of mouth and, and trying to get your salespeople to start promoting not only are you the sales and service, but, you know, we do have this rental business that can help supplement that. So I'll... Uh pose one other thought to that is that you have service agreements, right? So you have a customer base already. So, you know, in that regard, you can look at your own business model and say, okay, uh, we have this many rentals through the course of a year where you have to take a machine out of service and back up the facility while it's being serviced and load banked and all those kinds of things. So your own business can support uh, certain sizes of equipment and and I agree with the contractor that's your your number one thing but one mistake that I see companies like us make is assuming that these small rental yards are being utilized for power needs the differentiator is your expertise you really have to sell that expertise into your marketplace as being a solutions provider of technical complex power issues. And once you gain that reputation, you are sought after. It feeds upon itself. You just can't stumble. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we got a question back here. Yes, sir. 
Yes, in uh, my previous life, I was in the rental uh, business, and at that time, there was a very healthy return on investment uh, in generator rentals. But that's been some time ago, like back in the uh, late 80s, early 90s. So I'd like to ask you guys, what has happened to the ROI in generator rentals over the last decade? Has it remained constant? Has it, the ROI gone down? Or has it gone up? All right, who wants to jump in that, Joe? Oh, that's a little bit about that one. Well, I'd have to say right now that the increase in price from an OEM to the dealer's distributors has gone up much faster than the rental rates. Hmm. So yes, your ROI is trending the wrong way, and tier four is gonna put another ding in the wrong direction. However, if you guys see the press releases from the publicly traded companies like Agreco and Sunbelt and United, um, they're bragging at 40 to 44% ROI, so it's not a bad business right now. It's still good. Is that in the rain that you were familiar with back in the 80s? A little bit more than that? Probably a little bit better than that. Yeah. Joe has made excellent points because the, the cost of the product has mm -hmm. gone up more than the, the rental rate. Right. I mean, you think back 10 years ago, rental power was, wasn't really much, wasn't known for many people. And um, more and more getting, it, getting into it, a few have dropped off. Um, one large OEM got out of the business altogether. And they just produced the equipment. But uh, it's, it's not a bad business. And it's not that sophisticated in terms of back office. Uh, it's pretty simple off-the-shelf software to run it for you. And as long as you got some decent product support, you're good. Great. Got another question? You know, I, I guess it dovetails on his question over there. But so when it comes to rental rates, what, what is your philosophy? Is there going to be no increase in rental rates? Because manufacturers have obviously increased the price of their equipment. So what is your plan? So you guys catch that question? Yeah, I got it. Okay. The struggle with that, John, is that, you know, the uh, units of old, they were less money, and our strategic plan has been to keep that older equipment running as long as possible so that we can be the most competitive in the marketplace. Because knowing that Tier 4 final is here, when we have to replace that equipment, it's going to be about 40% more money. And that's going to force our rental rates up. You have to. Not to mention the maintenance of that equipment goes up. And your reputation is also at a greater risk because a lot of times you don't even know what you're putting that equipment out to run at. You know, somebody gives you their service insurance size and it's running a light bulb. Next thing you know, your, your catalytic converter and the exhaust and everything's going south. Uh, and the unit shuts down. Nobody understands the complexity of this equipment. And so being able to account for that costs money. And that has to be reflected in the rental rate. So it is going to be a challenge. I mean, I really miss the olden days, you know, relay logic and all that really cool stuff. This computer world we live in and all this tier four, it sucks. But that doesn't mean you can't make money. You just got to pass it on. Anybody else on the panel want to comment on that? All right. Uh, he's right. It's, it's, it's inevitable that the rates will have to go up, otherwise the business will just yeah. subside. So either customers are going to go without or they have to pay the piper. Um, these guys ain't going to do it for free. So are you guys setting your rates today, would you say, based on more of a market expectation or a product cost? Well, in the old days, it was 4 to 8% of acquisition, acquisition was your monthly rental rate. 4 and to 8%? 4 to 8%. Gotcha. 4% for your larger ones, maybe even 10% for your baby ones. And you get to 50% time utilization, you had a really nice return. Um, people are still struggling to keep their time utilization and up in the air there, but I don't see any more 10% of uh, acquisition going into the rental rates. So it's uh, market driven right now. And there's enough competition out there to keep, uh, keep everybody honest. Got it. Another question. Yeah, uh, 
Just to follow on, uh, on your last answer, um, what are some of the most common items that you are replacing to keep that rental equipment going? And is there a uh, magic number of X amount of hours that you're expecting it so it becomes profitable um, or the lifespan of a particular rental equipment? So was your first part of the question accessories that we invest in as part of that platform? No, he mentioned specifically that uh, one of his strategies to keep the costs down is to continually uh, replace certain things that may oh. fail. So the whole unit, let's say uh, a one meg or a half a meg unit is, is still there for, for use. My, my question was, what are the items that you're commonly replacing? Okay. Joe, that, I think that was your point, no, or was it Bob's? Well, the, one of the good things is that you're in the generator business, so you have the talent at your in your service department, right, to be able to address engines, radiators, you know, alternators, you name it. So it really is a matter of how much do you want to invest, and and it, you know, if you've got a a unit that is you know approaching being antiquated, you, you know, you probably don't want to spend any money on it. Just send it to auction. But if you've got a unit that has run triple shift for, you know, uh, for the majority of its life and it looks good, then you may elect to, you know, put some heads on it, um, maybe get the alternator clean dipped and baked, radiator done, and that unit is basically right back to square one. Good for another 20,000, 15,000 hours. And then Frankly, your hours on your equipment is, is basically proportional to your services and your depth of your services. So the better you service and take care of your equipment, the longer it's gonna last. Uh, I've, I've re-rented equipment from our competitors and I, it's like, holy cow, how in the world do they, does this work? I mean, you, we spend a day cleaning it and, and flushing the radiator before we can even put their equipment out on rent. So, you know, once you get that reputation that your equipment is spot on, now all of a sudden you've got your competitors, back to your question of customers, they're wanting to re-rent your equipment because you've developed the, relation, the re, uh, reputation of having the best reliable equipment in your marketplace. And that's the other equation to it. So, you know, it's, it's, it's all these things that come into a decision as to how you want to go forwards. So I take it we all agree that being proactive to that, we talked about when we started buying our rental fleet and we're going to test it and validate it, that's the time to begin to plan for those maintenance items, right? Not wait till it's got 10,000 hours on it and stuff starts breaking we're like, okay, now what do we do? So do you guys have a perspective on that? Do you have a, a standard that you've developed? Uh, where you basically follow from hour one, these are the things we do at these certain intervals. And I know, Joe, you mentioned you guys have some kind of institutionalized maintenance programs that you follow. Uh, do, do the rest of you folks have yeah. that kind of? Yeah, we, and we call that them stuff scheduled you, maintenance from SMF. And you built that in-house, or did you go out to get no, that? No, we, we did it in-house. Okay. And um, like Joe said, at some of the units, you can go 500 hours. We, on some of them, we put centrifuges for oil, so we can go close to 1,000 hours on them. Uh, but you know, once you scuff that cylinder, it doesn't mm -hmm. heal itself. So mm -hmm. you right. want to you want to be proactive. You want to make sure that you do your air filters in both. We have primary and secondary filters. Make sure you don't let them run with no filters, because once you damage, you're done. So uh, taking care of your equipment, making the investment, the um, oil analysis that's really a worthwhile venture. It'll give you a hint. It's almost like a crystal ball. It'll tell you, hey, you got some material in it doesn't belong in there. So it gives you a hint that there's something failing. And it doesn't cost very much. I think it's like 14 bucks. And you send it out and it comes back and it gives you really a life cycle of your engine. It tells you what's happening inside the engine. So by being proactive, by setting up the right uh, maintenance, doing the oil analysis, and then when the unit comes back, check into it and make sure that, it, that it's been taken care of on the job. So it's uh, the maintenance of it during the, the, the early days that's it go for a little bit longer. And you'll pay for it in spades when you go to sell it. Hmm. Somebody who's got good maintenance records and a solid piece of equipment will get top dollar in the marketplace. Just like a used car. So do you guys have an end of life 
view in that plan? I mean, is that part of your plan, or is it well, kind of like OEM, what Bob we like selling about? a lot of equipment, so uh, we'd like to see them roll out every three to four years. Three to four years. That's our okay. that's our typical flush out cycle. Gotcha. Going into tier four, you're not going to see that happen anymore. Right. In fact, every time we have a tier change, you get a giant pre buy, which really kills the next tier's sales cycle. Hmm. So going into tier four, the tier four interim sales jumped up before tier four kicks in. So now we see a big lull until people start getting lower in their fleets and then they'll start buying again. But uh, it's uh, all the OEMs are feeling the crunch right now because nobody wants to be an early adopter on this technology. And it's and there's some big gaps. I mean, if you think about an engine program, and I'll talk about this tomorrow, tier four final for the generator business is no different than like a truck engine. We're considered mobile hmm. only because we don't stay in one location. Our brothers and sisters on the standby generator set side, they never had to adopt to these standards. They got to keep the older standards. So your engine programs have to develop these engines for a level that's only being used in rental. Hmm. So don't hold your breath for a two megawatt generator set in the tier four final area because when you look at the engine expense to develop that engine, it is, I can't even give you the number because it's, it shocks me internally what it, they charge us, but it's humongous. So if you're only gonna sell that engine into the rental space, there is no ROI as an OEM. Mm. So you just won't do it. Yeah, yeah. Got another question. Yeah. Uh, my question is in regards to uh, 50 hertz, basically. Um, what, I exited the generator business back in uh, 2008, and you know, every, anybody that's been in the business for a while knows that it used to be you just turn your uh, mechanical or electronic governor down, and you know, you're just your regulator, and you're good to go. But from what I understand, there's been a trend away from that, um, and 50 hertz applications are uh, still in abundance. Uh, you know, at least. I know I did a lot of them in the generator business, and I know a lot of our customers do now. What what is what are you seeing the trend right now to how that's going that problem is going to be solved? We all miss mechanical engines. Take your screwdriver, dial them down. Life is great. Um, yes, Bob, the electronic engines are killing us, and there's no magic screws. There are some uh, engines out there with a magic dip switch. Mm -hmm. But all you're doing over there is changing over to a different flash file that runs the engine. So again, depending on the node, depending on the engine, there may or may not be 50 hertz capability in some products, at least from us. When you do have that requirement, that's a kerching. <laughs> so do you guys have a separate fleet of uh, generators that are 50 hertz to meet that need? Or you just send the business on and well, don't? The, the issue is right now is, with, is again with tier four. So you have to come up with fuel maps for both 1500 RPM and 1800 RPM. So it's a, it's a whole hmm. new engine development program, which may or may not include hardware, injectors, hmm. turbos, stuff like that included. If you can get by with the mapping, yeah, you can pretty much easily do it. And our larger stuff, we settle internationally, yes, it's not much of a big hmm. deal, but some of the smaller ones, it's not easy. These engine guys are screaming and crying because you're, you're trying to run this engine at this one special little power band where it's, it's clean, it's fuel efficient, it's great, you've got your great boost pressures, everything's wonderful, and you need to take off 300 RPM, and you're like, wow. Mm -hmm. You just lost all this horsepower and your fuel maps all over the place, you're, you're chasing your tail. So I want to make sure I understand, if I wanted to buy a Caterpillar, 100 kW rental, that's 50 hertz only. It doesn't exist today. You could buy that internationally. Internationally, yes. But I couldn't use it here in the States. It would not be EP approved. Okay, just want to clarify that for the audience. All right, other questions? Okay, we did have a question from the audience a little earlier, and I'll just mention this. Uh, I mean, let me get there. Do you guys also get the call for rental transfer switches? So maybe that, maybe that can be a lead off into some of the other accessory products uh, that we get opportunities for. So anybody get calls for more than just generators and cables and even transformers? Talk about uh, transfer switches. 
Um, sure. Um, yes, we get calls all the time for transfer switches, circuit breakers, cable transformers, and um, that's really um, that's really how a lot of us um, work together, you know, in completing that package. Um, yeah. What, what else? Would, like. Well, so in a transfer switch, and I think I don't know who asked the question, but I assume it's as a DD, you're. You've got a standby generator customer's transfer switch fails, and you've got you know a six-week lead time on getting a new transfer switch. Is rental as op an option? Yeah, absolutely, and um, there's resources. Um, I, our company to be one that we have um, a pretty large rental fleet um, on transfer switches, um, switch gear in general, and um, we're actually expanding that product offering um, as we speak, as long as well as medium, low and medium voltage cable, um, and obviously transformers. So. How many dealers have actually rented transfer switches in that dis application I just described? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I think we've still got plenty of time here, Lyndon. We got any more audience questions? I've got a couple more I'm going to hit on here if there's not any audience questions. I got a question for the audience. There you go. Okay, Bob. Does anybody out there, I'd love to know, or anyone, who in the world came up with sizing rental units with KVA <laughs> numbers? I got that. Where did that come Here, from? I got that. I'm old enough to actually be there. In the 70s, there was no such thing. So you would get a generator like 100 kW, and it was 100 kVA. And now you get a three-phase system. And you got some motor loads. And all of a sudden, you're stripping the magnetic field out of the kW that's in the generator. You got plenty of engine, but to support the voltage from the regulator, you need additional magnetism. So EXA and UL, they all acted on it. And I think it was UL that said, okay, what's the real need? And they said, electric motors, they run at 0.9 power factor. That means it'll take its regular amount of power, but then it throws back 10% towards the power source. Well, if you got voltage coming this way, you got voltage coming back that's this way, the voltage will drop. The regulator reaches into the magnetics to increase the intensity to overcome this reverse current to keep the KW. So it doesn't cost you any horsepower, doesn't cost you any fuel, but you gotta put the copper in it. So the agency said, well, if 10% is great, let's double it. <laughs> and the salespeople said, wow, 20% more amps. But it's at 0.8 power factor. Unless your load is at 0.8, guess what? You're not gonna get those amps. Those amps only come to you if the load creates the condition. That's right. So those are reactive amps, no loss of energy. No loss of fuel, no loss of horsepower. So how That's many it. of y'all have done a load bank test and your technician calls you and says, I can't get it to carry the nameplate rating and he's got a resistive only load bank. That's what Chris is talking about, right? 20%. He's overloading it, 20%. 20 20% 20 overload. Can't There's figure out why he can't carry 20% overload. There's people in the industry renting uh, load banks from us, test generators, standby generators, and every one they test overheats. So the guy that was renting them, I asked him, I said, what impasse are you testing to? He goes, let me make a call. He goes, nameplate. Would you be surprised that overheated? <laughs> You're pulling 20% higher rating. Exactly. They're making money. <laughs> They're making money. Clean the radiator. They would. They'd clean the radiator and they would backwash it. They would rebuild the water pump and they wouldn't not do the test again. But they made their money. We made our money on the load bank. So let's talk a little bit about rates for a minute. We kind of touched on that earlier, how to get that. And Joe, you mentioned 5 to 8% of the investment for the monthly rental rate, I think was the math you used. Uh, is that the, the math that the rest of you guys use, or is it some similar math? I mean, there's, I know there's people in the audience that wonder, okay, I'm going to buy this quarter million dollars worth of uh, generators. How do I decide, besides going out in the marketplace, which is, of course, one way to do it, right? Uh, how do I really decide what's going to be my best rate and, and how do you set different rates, right? So you've got standby, single shift, double shift, continuous duty. Um, how do you guys actually set those rates? That's open to the whole panel, so y'all jump on it. It's black magic. <laughs> uh, I mean, the standard rule of thumb has always been single shift is your, you know, four to eight percent of acquisition. Your Double shift is one and a half times that rental rate, and if you're going to run prime power around the clock, you just double your, your single shift rate. You'll see a lot of people uh, still using this methodology, where by which 
three days equals a week, three weeks equals a month. Um, but we're starting to see some people starting to get like uh, demand type pricing, kind of like airline seats. Hmm. When they look in their yard and says, oh, I got one left, so guess what? Uh, it's here now. And uh, some are getting away with it. You see in some manufacturers and rental houses um, charging a lot more for a daily rate Mm-hmm. When you factor in the, you know, the three days, the three weeks, the math doesn't add up anymore. The monthly rental rate might be the same, but they're getting a lot more money in the, uh, the smaller rental periods. So uh, you're seeing a lot of dynamics out there in terms of pricing. And again, it's, there's a lot more competition, and you have to get a lot more creative in terms of how you're going to get your money back. There's one other application I'm curious about, and I'm really jealous of this, is along the coast along the Atlantic coast you know the hurricane area I know I ran across a lot of you guys could tell me where customers want to basically pay you to have a generator ready to go in case of a hurricane Mm -hmm. holy cow what a deal that is we live in Arizona and it sucks because we don't have hurricanes. We don't have tornadoes, we don't have earthquakes. So I'm really jealous of that matrix. How does that work from a rental rate? Uh, they are negotiated up front and they're usually for the called hurricane season. And um, there's two different prices and two different rate structures, you know, whether it's on the dealership's yard or if it's on the customer's yard. Um, from what I can tell out right now, all of the cat dealers actually do do it by serial number, it's their asset. There have been some other rental houses that said, I'll give you, I'll make sure you have one available. And I remember when Katrina happened, that particular company was sued because their assets were actually washed away and didn't have much of a choice there. But uh, it's, uh, it's, it's good money because it you know, usually doesn't run, but they're usually very de- deeply discounted because you're betting on the come. But you've got to be able to deliver Yeah. when the time comes. Yeah. Sometimes you can't get to the job site. Right. So well, that's get, not your problem, no. Oh, yes, it is. It will be if you don't have it you in your contract. You're yeah, getting it over there. You try to get extra money for it. Yep. Really? Oh, yeah. You've got to build your contract to cover all those. Your contingencies have to have contingencies. What did you say about sometimes, sometimes you can't get the unit to the job site if the bridges are washed out. The contract says you will have it on his yard. Okay, so you, you, you're taking a gamble as well. Right. Got some more questions? Yeah, got a question in the audience. What is your check-in process on distribution gear, transfer switches, eyeline panels, that kind of thing? and? Do you see any responsibility from a legal standpoint if something were to fail at the job it was on and that carried over and you didn't catch it to the next job? Okay, so your question is, it was on an existing job, something failed, and you're not aware of it. You roll it to the next job. Is there liabilities? Obviously, yeah, no doubt. Kind of goes back to that checks and balances, right? You want to roll it from your job, last job back into your shop and test it before you roll it out to the next job. I guess in short, I'm asking the panel, are you guys just doing visual inspections or are you doing any kind of testing when, when the equipment comes back? I, speaking for, for our, my, ourself, our company, um, any type of rental product that goes out is, ob- is obviously tested beforehand and then thoroughly tested after it comes back off of rent. And there... They do. Chad can actually speak a little bit better on the testing procedures because he was part of, at least our company's um, writer of the process. But there is absolutely, especially on switch gear, um, I know that they thoroughly test it because you know there there are instances where you, you know if you have an issue, it's you know it, it comes back on the testing side of things. So we there's absolutely a procedure and process every time. Something goes out the door, gets tested, and then absolutely every time it comes back off of rent, before it goes back on rent, it gets tested as soon as it gets back to our shops. A bunch of this equipment that we rent such as transfer switches, for example, they're not designed to be transported. They're designed to be installed in a building and forgotten about for 30 years till they're replaced. So with that being said, they don't travel very well. 
uh, the manufacturers aren't building them to withstand the vibration and everything else that comes behind it. So absolutely everything gets tested before and after to alleviate that uh, you know, possibility that something happened even in transit or customer misapplication or whatnot. Great. Well, this has been a good discussion. I think we need to give the panel a warm uh, appreciation and applause here. Thank you, guys. <laughs>